Hi everyone, welcome to Creditor Watch's session where we'll be talking about the newly released Business Risk Index. A big thank you to RFI for um, hosting us today. We're really looking forward to presenting this. The Business Risk Index was, you know, a, probably an idea, a thought bubble of mine, you know, four or five years ago. And, and over time, it's become clear that, you know, our data is um, good enough, predictive enough, valuable enough to actually put together some sort of index, which is which is ultimately where the business risk in, index um, has come from. In the last 12 months, we've worked extremely closely with James O'Donnell from Open Analytics. James, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Pat. Great to be here. Um, without James and his team's obviously input and assistance and genius, we wouldn't have been able to launch the Business Risk Index and of course also to the other brainchild um, in Mitchy Copa, who is our GM of communications and uh, marketing. So look, a little bit about Creditor Watch before we kick off to sort of set the scene. We're a commercial credit reporting agency, commercial reporting bureau, whichever way you want to discuss it, but ultimately we're a data company um, at heart. So we provide a full suite of credit management tools from online um, credit application to onboard um, customers and, and, and process applications and run them through decisioning um, engines through to a suite of credit reports, risk scores, payment ratings, um, monitoring alerts and of course being a technology company we put a huge emphasis on integration and, and having a, a single product suite as well. So um, but ultimately, we're not here to talk about Creditor Watch and the products. Um, we do have a huge amount of data, of course, that comes in, and, and that is ultimately what is feeding the business risk index is sort of 30 plus data sources, public, private, um, and, and government. And James will take us through, you know, what, what that is, how it works um, in just a second. But, you know, to talk about the business risk index itself, it really is a game changer. Um, first and foremost, for, for lenders um, and, and creditors out there providing both you know, finance and, and trade credit um, themselves. But also what we've started to see is there's a huge um, demand from, from researchers and importantly from government, from policymakers, wanting to understand which <coughs> regions in particular um, <coughs> are performing well or which ones are at risk. They wanna understand where investment should be made. They wanna understand how his historical investment has performed and of course, at the juncture we find ourselves in at the moment, um, coming out of COVID, having had you know 20 plus months of um, of really turbulent, affected times, um, how how is the future progressing? What does it look like, and and where are we going to end up? So the the data that's powering it is of of course the, the most important thing, and I think what's important to remember is that the data behind the business risk index is also powering our risk scores, our pay, our credit ratings, and and of course. Our, um, our credit report. So really exciting to get this launch. There's been a phenomenal reaction to it so far, just in the in the two two weeks or so that um, that we've really been promoting it out there and talking about it. Um, and it will be an important barometer of Australia's economic health, um, particularly as we navigate you know the choppy economic um, conditions that that we expect to see as we come out of lockdown. And of course, move away from that sort of synthetic environment that we find ourselves in whether that's synthesized by government um, subsidy and government support, or the fact that you know, we're in lockdowns, um, state borders are closed, and, and, and of course, international borders are closed. As we move out of that and get into you know, pre-COVID conditions, and, and let's call them you know, post-COVID conditions, um, this, this index really is gonna come into its own, um, and, we, and we look forward to, uh, to presenting on it on a monthly basis when we, when we release the results um, in the middle of each month. You can jump onto the website creditorwatch.com.au and there's a um, there's a panel on the front there that you can click through or creditorwatch.com.au forward slash business risk index um, to be actually able to access the the results themselves, the stats, and actually interact with you know interactive maps to have a look at which industries and which regions are really affected. But look, that's enough from me for now. I will pass over over to James. James can give a little bit of an introduction to himself, which he's always extremely humble about, and then of course, talk about the business risk index itself. Thanks, James. Thanks very much, Pat, for that nice introduction. So James O'Donnell, I'm the director of a company called Open Analytics, and what, what we do is we specialise in all things credit management. 
So the, the typical thing that we do is work with the, the bigger banks to build credit rating systems and, and credit decisioning systems. Uh, okay, so the, the business risk index, what it is is a new economic indicator and it's a future measure of insolvency risk that we're publishing at a regional level. So we're publishing it for about 300 regions across the country. The way I like to simplify it and, and describe it uh, to the lay person so it's easy to understand is it, it's good to think of it as a regional credit rating. So you, you'll typically think of credit ratings being associated with individual businesses. And of course, they measure the credit quality or the likelihood of a, a individual business going insolvent. What, what, we're, what we've produced here really by analogy is a credit rating for a region. So what that is, is for each region, the average insolvency risk or average um, credit quality for, for that area. So we've developed it on what's known as uh, SA3 or Statistical Aggregate 3. So that's just simply an aggregation of postcodes. It's, it's fairly standard. There's about 300 of those regions across the country. And for a bit of context, within the bigger city centres like Melbourne and Sydney, there's 40 or 50 of the, those regions. So it's quite granular. Uh, the population behind it, we've calibrated the, the rating system or rating model on about 1.1 million regular ASIC registered PTY LTD companies and we filter down to those that are credit active. So that simply means businesses that have had any bureau activity or, or sort of trade credit in the last sort of 10 years or so. So it's a big population. Um, so what what it looks like, the data behind it, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a you can think of it as a credit rating, but what we're essentially doing is publishing a probability of default, sometimes shorthand for that is a PD, for each of those 300 odd regions. So if you look at the, the table on the top left of your screen there, what we do is we simply run the models, we assign a regional average PD. Then what we do is we simply rank each region from best to worst. So best being the lowest uh, default risk, worst being the highest. Then the in index that we'll publish is simply a, what's known as a, a rank index and it's on a percentile scale. And all that means is we simply uh, order everything and put it on a, a scale of 0 to 100. So the region that gets a, a score of zero is basically the highest risk region in the country. And on the flip side, the, the region that gets a, an index of 100 is the, is the best uh, or lowest risk region in the country. So to get a sense of kind of what that sort of looks like over time, the sort of the chart on the index on the, uh, in the inset there sort of shows the average default risk, uh, default rates over the last sort of four years or so in sort of 10% groups. So the index from 0 to 10, 10 to 20, et cetera. And what we tend to see certainly in the sort of bottom two deciles, so indexes between 0 and 20, and probably sort of all the way up to the, the bottom three. So index of sort of less than 30 will, will tend to mean an a insolvency risk that's quite a long way above, above the average. Okay, so I, I mentioned it's a, it's a credit rating and of course it's a model. Um, so just, just a bit about the data, you know, the model structure and the data behind it. So there, there's fundamentally two data types feeding into the index. So number one is what we sort of describe as our more dynamic um, predictors. And that's essentially, we're, we're essentially using the machinery that Credit Watch uses to credit rate individual businesses. Now that data is, at an individual business level, it's real time, essentially updates daily. And what we're, the best way to think about this is we're essentially um, credit rating each individual business and rolling that up to the, the regional level. That's sort of the, the dominant sort of part of the model. But equally important is what we describe as the more stru structural or sort of more traditional economic indicators. Um, I won't go through all of them, but there's a list of them there on the screen. But probably the, the interesting ones that, that sort of come out are. Um, anything around sort of commercial property prices and commercial rents. So essentially that the largest overhead for, for individual businesses. And then various measures of um, what can broadly be thought of as wealth and economic status. So various indices of economic um, opportunity, median income. There's a number of factors in there that all roughly speaking correlate to the, the wealth and economic resources of the region. So they're blended together into the, the credit rating. And then, then just to sort of show how we, we, we think it should be used in a practical sense. If you, 
if you group the index up into either 10 or 20% groups on the chart there on your screen, that's sort of showing a 20% grouping. The vertical axis is, uh, is the one year insolvency rate. And then each of those lines are the 20% group. So the highest risk one at the top is basically all regions that we assign an index of 20 or less to. Yeah, the next line is sort of 20 to 40, et cetera, et cetera, through to the through to the lowest risk group there. So you can see the sort of spread. It's quite a quite a broad spread of um, insolvency rates, and it's quite consistent over time. So just to, to zero in on that, if you sort of pull out the worst of the worst, the sort of bottom 10% and the top 10% and sort of compare that to the national average is, is there on your screen. So basically what, what this is showing is that when we, you know, through our back, back testing, we can see that when we put regions in those sort of bottom deciles or, or quintiles, they're, they're consistently quite a, you know, there's quite a large spread of insolvency risk. Okay, so look, that, that's enough about sort of defining what the index is. So, yeah, as Patrick said, we've just released this last week. So it's sort of publicly available on, on Credit Watch's website. But we've sort of been knee deep in the data for the last sort of month or so, sort of trying to digest the results. Now, there's a lot to go through, but I'll, I'll just pull out a few sort of key sort of themes that we've picked up. So we've certainly seen that regional areas are outperforming um, urban and, and city centres. Um, and particularly the eastern seaboard CBDs, so Melbourne, um, Sydney and Brisbane have deteriorated quite a bit over the, the period impacted by, by COVID. Um, there's two quite standout sort of hotspots in, in terms of very, very high insolvency risk, and they are the Gold Coast. So tourism regions in, in Queensland, but very much centred on the, the Gold Coast Shire, and then Western Sydney, sort of around that sort of Canterbury, Bankstown and, and surrounding suburbs. Um, so there's sort of some of the high risk areas. There's actually a lot of um, positive data that, that we can see as well. So certainly seeing regions that are sort of dominated by agribusiness are actually performing quite well and are actually sort of trending, trending up to higher indices. And just a few call outs there. So Mackay, so it's sort of the, the sugarcane capital of, of Queensland, um, the WA wheat belt and some of those sort of wine regions like the Yarra in Victoria, all sort of performing quite well. Um, also, a trend was sort of seeing um, manufacturing centres tend to outperform the rest of the, the states that they sit within. So we've been digging, um, doing, doing a few case studies and looking into Geelong in particular in Victoria, which is performing quite a bit better than, than the rest of Victoria and certainly Melbourne City. Um, and the, the last point up there on the screen is, is more of a macro point that we're seeing that, that the effects of both government intervention and leniency from creditors, whether they're sort of banks or the ATO, um, are still having that sort of positive effect on insolvency rates. So insolvency rates are still, as of today, quite low, but we're expecting them to sort of snap back to pre-COVID levels and a little bit higher in the next sort of 12 to 18 months. So just a, a few um, visuals to kind of show some of these insights. So I'll start with a very top level view of states. So this, this chart sort of shows the index over time for the, the largest states in Australia. Um, so probably a couple of call outs at the top there. South Australia is quite a, a standout. Um, well, interestingly for South Australia, it has this interesting combination of quite sort of high net wealth and disposable income, but it, yet at the same time, low property price, um, you know, low, low rental costs, which is, is quite unique to that area. Um, at the other end of the scale, Queensland is quite consistently the, the highest risk state. And a lot of that is driven by that sort of Gold Coast region. And then sort of the, the relativities between um, New South Wales and, and Victoria are quite interesting. Um, so historically, um, Victoria has been lower risk than, than New South Wales, but we've certainly seen sort of convergence there. And it's not New South Wales getting better, it's probably more a, a factor of deterioration in, in Victoria. And you certainly see that a similar sort of trend when you sort of compare the Melbourne and, and Sydney CBDs. Um, get, as I dig into this data, I actually feel that the, the state level, it's interesting to look at state views, but within every state, there's, there's quite high risk and quite low risk regions. So I, I think the more sort of more relevant viewers to actually look at the individual regions. So I sort of thought of different ways to, to show this, but this, this is what's known as a, a bubble plot. And what 
this is a, a way to put all the regions and all the data on a single visual. So I'll take a, a little bit of time to explain what, what the chart is showing. So each uh, dot or bubble is, is each one of the 300 odd um, SA3 regions. The size of the bubble correlates to the number of businesses within the region. So you can see, I've sort of put a few names on there for, to, for reference points. So you can sort of see Sydney there, sort of the biggest bubble um, in the middle there. Um, now the axis is the axis, the vertical axis measures last year's default rate. So what we've observed in terms of a, a liquidation or insolvency rate over the last 12 months. So that's sort of the backward looking view. And the horizontal axis shows um, our predicted PD for the next 12 months. So that's the forward looking view that the index is based around. So basically the further to the right you are on the chart, the, the, you know, the higher risk you are in terms of the, the index and the more vertical it's sort of showing how your performance sort of last year. Um, now I'll, I'll use this as a tool to sort of dig into a few regions. So first of all, the, the hotspots I mentioned before, if we look at sort of the top 10 sort of, or the bottom 10, the, the worst sort of performing regions, they're all concentrated in New South Wales and Queensland and more specifically in the Gold Coast and in Western Sydney. So a few names are up there on the screen. Um, so places like Southport, Oxenford, Coolangatta, Gold Coast North, they're all regions within the, the Gold Coast Shire. And then some other sort of names there, sort of Canterbury, Bankstown, sort of large sort of um, centres in the west of Sydney there and sort of Maryland, Guildford and sort of suburbs that surround those. So those, those areas stand out as quite high risk. Um, then this sort of, this view of the world sort of shows, I've filtered the data down to um, regions with quite large populations. So filtered down to regions that have at least 5,000 credit um, active ASIC registered businesses, tends to filter out some of those sort of regional areas. So first thing to draw your attention to is the, the capital city view. So you can see highlighted in red, all the major capital cities. So you, you do see that sort of Eastern seaboard sort of clustering around that sort of 6% PD, and all of those have deteriorated somewhat. Um, we're, at this stage, we're, we're a bit more pessimistic on, on Melbourne than, than Sydney. Um, and that we're seeing a few things with sort of credit scores deteriorating. Um, the numbers of business to business trade payment defaults have shot up quite a bit in Melbourne. So yeah, you know, we're sort of seeing probably a bit more de deterioration in Melbourne than the other capital cities. Um, and then sort of on, on the other side, sort of Perth and Adelaide is sort of, sort of faring quite well. And then you'll notice some other names on the charts there, but yeah, you know, highlighted highlighting places like Newcastle, for example, it's quite a bit lower risk than, than Sydney at the moment. Geelong, I mentioned before, within Victoria is quite a bit lower risk than the, than the city. So we're definitely seeing that split between the sort of urban areas that are a bit higher risk than some of the, the bigger regional centres. Um, to finish off on the on the summary of the insights, uh, th this graph that we like to, to show and, and keep quite a close eye on, this is sort of a macro view of, of using Credit Watch's data. And it's, our, it's kind of our measure of, um, it's like a dynamic GDP. So what Credit Watch sources a, a, a broad range of transactional data, so B2B payments, so we're capturing basically how businesses are paying each other. And a good measure is just the, the sheer volume of trade receivables. So when we look at all of our data suppliers, we add up all their trade receivables at a point in time, and then we compare that to how it looked a year ago. So it's a, basically a trade receivables growth. Where that number's positive, it means businesses that, that we're monitoring are, are on average um, growing and doing more trade. Where that gets into negative territory, the, there's basically contraction that businesses turnover has dropped. So pretty obvious period there, sort of the, the period for which JobKeeper was in place. You can see the you know, quite big sort of contraction in, in trade. And in, in some sense, that was the hole that JobKeeper and other support mechanisms were designed to fill. Um, things are actually starting to trend positively just as, as, um, as JobKeeper was being switched off, sort of around March. Um, but then, as we all know, unfortunately, Delta kicked in and the, the second wave of, of lockdowns, which uh, some of us are still in, and some of us have just got out of. So you saw that sort of real big contraction um, in those more recent periods. 
Um, I should say we're actually quite optimistic that now that Sydney's opened up, um, Melbourne should be pretty soon to follow. Um, we actually expect that number to start heading north again and as businesses start to open up and trade. Okay, so look, that's that's probably a good summary of what we've seen in the data. We we also will be releasing a number of individual case studies on the website over time for individual regions. So some of those sort of regional areas, um, some of those manufacturing centres, a look at some of the CBD. So so keep an eye out for that. Um, but in the meantime, I might hand over to to Patrick to cover the the most recent months' insights from the from the data. Thanks for that, James. That's great. And I think <clears throat> to, to James's earlier point, one of the challenging things was finding out or working out which uh, which graphs and which insights to share. There are just so many um, that are that are either in other reports or, or that we'll we'll sort of start to report on in the future. So I think that gives a fantastic, you know, high level national, uh, regional, and state based approach. And then of course having a look at that trade receivables information. You know, just that huge turn downturn in, um, in in revenue, particularly for, for small businesses, you know, they're, they're really doing it tough at the moment. A lot of them just treading water and hoping that, you know, this uh, this release from lockdown, you know, we get to see a nice return to, you know, profitability and and um, and, and just having, you know, secure businesses and, and, and businesses that can continue to grow out of lockdown. So we're certainly looking forward to seeing that um, that downturn on that graph start to start to go in the right direction, and, and I think you know being free for for summer and Christmas and, and holidays, you know, no doubt there's plenty of people out there who who are looking forward to uh, to spending what they do have. There's record savings out there, which is which is certainly a a very big positive. It's not a normal sort of recession to go through that's going to take years to get out of. There there will be a uh, quick bounce back, and we're already already starting to see. Um, some green shoots in in our um, in our stats and, and in our numbers as well, which is fantastic because it's been a bit bleak for too long as far as I'm concerned. So look, looking at an industry level probability of default, this is a this is a, a report that we have we have shared in you know the last couple of business risk reviews, which will of course be um, uh, replaced with our business risk index. However, we'll still start to look at we'll still look at uh, probability of default. By industry, the leading one here, probably no surprises. Food and beverage services have done it extremely tough. You know, there was plenty of uproar about a two-week shutdown for the construction industry, and and you know, you, you've got to really feel for food and beverage, and of course retail as well. That you know, arguably have been have been shut down for you know, in, in some cases, 80% of the last uh, you know, almost two years. So, um, the the they're, they're ex we're expecting to see that you know start to turn, which is good. You know, I'm I'm in Sydney and it's it's borderline impossible to get a you know a booking at anywhere for lunch or or dinner. You know, whether it's during the week or on the weekend. So that's a really good positive sign for them. Arts and recreation services, um, again, no surprises there. And there has been discussion around you know targeted relief for businesses in that industry um, just this week, which is great. And, and of course, the last one there, financial insurance services. What we're seeing is a lot of pressure on, you know, smaller advisors, brokers, um, you know, uh, smaller lenders that, that are very reliant on, in particular, small business loans as well. Um, you're starting to see, you know, less business um, loans out there. Is no one, you know, they don't want to take on debt through this, um, you know, uncertain period. So plenty of pressure on those, but again, starting to see, um, starting to see a turn in that space. At the other end of the spectrum, James touched on, you know, those primary industries, mining, ag, and of course, the other one there that that is that is done uh, doing a lot better than it than it did at the beginning is health healthcare and, and social assistance. It was an interesting one where it sort of struggled initially for, for probably the first six to nine months of of, uh, of COVID and the lockdowns last year, as all uh, resources were turned to COVID related, you know, health services rather than you know, elective surgeries and, and whatnot. Um, however, that is certainly uh, that turned quite quickly since um, uh, since late last year, which is which is a positive for that sector. And of course, um, manufacturing and, and wholesale trade. There's been a lot of talk about you know manufacturing being um, being dead or dying in um, in Australia. That certainly isn't the case. We've seen a resurgence there, which is which is fantastic. And I think with those supply chain, particularly the uh, you know international logistic issues that we're seeing, um, that local manufacturing. Um, market is, has seen an uptick, which is great news. 
On the next slide, um, a fairly new report that we've released as well is looking at payment arrears by industry. So this is essentially reporting on the proportion of businesses in a specific industry that are paying 60 plus days um, overdue. First one there is construction. Now, construction is, is an interesting one and I, and I might throw to James in a second on this, you know, that they are, they are by, not by, by far the, the leader in terms of, you know, the number of businesses within their industry paying 60 days overdue. However, interestingly, they are not the riskiest industry from a probability of default. Can you just touch on that for me, please, James? Yeah, so construction really is a bit of a special case. So obviously there's a lot of project finance. So the the way I sort of think about the construction industry, they they regularly pay late, but they tend to eventually pay. So the the sort of project finance element sort of has an impact there. So if you look at the slide before, construction is about the average risk. It's actually a little bit lower risk than average. It's about sort of 3.3%, a few from the from the right. But yeah, so it's a bit of an interesting one, one compared to the other industries. And there's pressure on it, uh, specific COVID pressure on it at the moment with, you know, either lockdowns, um, supply chain issues or reduced workers on site, which means, you know, projects are, of course, blowing out and that is pushing out, um, you know, project finance as a, as a really good example, as James touched on. Um, the, the, the next two rounding out um, the top three in terms of payment arrears, accommodation, food and beverage, of course, and transport, postal and warehousing. A lot of people go, oh, hold on a second, you know, postal warehousing, you know, they think about, um, they think about uh, eBay and Afterpay and Zip and, you know, all everyone doing, sitting at home doing um, e-commerce and, and online shopping. Um, the fact is that there's some very, very big players in, in the transport space like Qantas and um, and Virgin, of course, and then also looking at, you know, trains and, and buses and, and um, you know, who, who are providing that sort of transport for, for hospitality, sorry, not hospitality, for, for vacations as, uh, as an example. Um, and of course, um, a big move to um, the adoption of, of, of e-signatures, for example, has put pressure on, um, you know, local couriers and, and whatnot who are, who are used to sort of taking around contracts. So, so there's there's plenty of little um, you know little niche individual industries that that are doing well, but but other larger ones that have been um, greatly affected. At the other end of the graph, um, we, we've we've got uh, healthcare paying extremely well, and ag, forestry, and fishing as well. Um, and and there is a you know sizable difference there that you can see between you know the, the top the top um, or worst payer and 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 the, and the best payer. Um, however, you know that that sort of middle middle majority is, is quite close together. Um, this will be a really good one to, to watch as, as are most of the graphs to be fair, but I think we can actually start to see some real movement month to month. We know that certain industries shut down over, um, over, over Christmas and, and construction is one of them where typically we see times blow out a little bit more than usual as, as people are away or, or work stops through you know, late December and, and, and then into, into the January period. Um, and uh, of course, accommodation, food and beverage as that comes back online um, will hopefully be quite cash rich. The, uh, the, the last slide we have here is looking at the, the main sort of, you know, um, indicators, credit indicators that we have regularly reported on um, since we introduced, you know, our business risk review a, a few years ago. Um, still extremely important, um, somewhat lagging indicators, of course, compared to um, the forward-looking insolvency risk that the business risk index um, provides. However, the important one here for me is the credit inquiries. We saw that climb um, really well from the back end of last year through to sort of June, July this year. That's the heartbeat of, you know, trade. It is looking at B2B transactions. It is, you know, businesses applying for, for trade credit or finance. Um, and it's also suppliers, creditors um, performing, you know, in searches, credit reports, inquiries on, you know, existing or, or, or new customers too. Um, we saw that go drop down in, in sort of July, fall flat and has been flat for a couple of months now. Um, and, and our expectation is from November onwards, we will start to see that um, climb somewhat. Um, December, Jan it, it is always down on a relative basis, but looking back on, on how it performs from a, um, uh, a year on year and, and pre-COVID numbers will, will be interesting to watch as well. External administrations, as we know, 
um, are at uh, all time lows and, and have been for a very long time. There was some increase, some sustained increases in, in the, towards the start of the year. However, that came right back off again once lockdown kicked in in, in July and August. Um, the banks and the ATO are ultimately the big, big drivers of, of the growth that we'll see from this. And we're not expecting them to get back on to their normal collection rhythms until, you know, probably, uh, you know, early, more likely mid next year. Um, they account for, you know, a, a large percentage of, of administrations um, in Australia. Um, so until that starts to occur, you know, we expect it to remain quite flat and then there will be a sustained increase. That sustained increase shouldn't be cause for concern. We have to get back to our normal, you know, collection rhythms. We have to get back to normal insolvency numbers that we saw in pre-COVID times. And the only way to do that is to see upward tick. I think importantly from an ATO perspective, they, they, they're going to start registering their ATO tax defaults, something that's been on the agenda and spoken about by the ATO and, and, um, and credit bureaus like Creditor Watch who have been pushing for, for that default data to be released to, um, um, to reporting agencies, for example. Um, you know, far too often we see a company going to administration that was essentially paying all of their normal suppliers on time. However, um, if they get put into administration by the ATO and it turns out they've got this whopping big ATO tax debt that's been around for, for months, if not years. And if everyone knew that they had that um, uh, liability hanging over them, they would have ultimately reduced their um, reduced the credit limit or, or reassessed the, the, the way they were treating that company from a credit risk perspective. So that data should start to be shared in the next couple of weeks with Creditor Watch. You'll be able to see those those defaults within the credit reports and within monitoring and alerts. So if you're monitoring your debtors, we will send out email alerts or API alerts, um, notifications when an ATO tax default is registered. So that's gonna be really powerful information. And of course that will in time be fed into the risk index and into our uh, credit rating system too. Um, court actions and payment defaults, very similar. They've been at record lows since, uh, since COVID hit. Um, you know, uh, creditors are very supportive of, of, of their uh, of their fellow Australians, of their customers. They want to nurse them through and, and keep them as a customer rather than send them down the path to administration. So similar expectation, once the, once the country starts to open back up, we will see a sustained increase. We did start to see increases in payment defaults um, through to sort of June, July, and then of course they've come back off. So look, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're optimistic, we're positive, like James said. Um, we just need to get out of uh, out of lockdown, open the borders up, you know, nationally, and then of course internationally, which is which is a real positive. So I think that is the last slide. Look, as I said, there's um, plenty of information on creditorwatch.com.au forward slash business risk index. There's um, there's articles with additional um, with additional insights. There's case studies that James spoke about as well. So please, I encourage you to jump on there. But also I encourage you to, to get in contact with us and ask questions um, where, where relevant or where there is interest, whether that's data behind the risk index itself or the product suite um, that's ultimately powering some of that. We're, uh, we're very keen to, to have a chat. Um, James, as always, pleasure, pleasure presenting with you. So thank you for your time and, and all your effort. And we look forward to those uh, future iterations. No, thanks, for, thanks very much, Pat, always a pleasure. And um, thank you all for taking the time to tune in and of course um, uh, for the hosts as well for uh, including us in the schedule. All the best everyone. We will see you very soon. Um, stay safe and have a fantastic Christmas period as we roll into that.